Hello, and welcome to the Slate Political Gab Fest. February 2nd, 2023, the Is Police Reform Even Possible edition. I'm David Plotz of CityCast, shaking off a little bit of a cold, so my voice sounds funny. And I'm in Washington, D.C. You know who's not in Washington, D.C.? John Dickerson of CBS Primetime. Hello, John Dickerson in New York. Hello, David. I'm I'm not in D.C., but I will be next week for the State of the Union. Oh, well, if you have a minute, yell. I'll be here, too. Also not in D.C., nor... In New Haven is Emily Bazelon of the New York Times Magazine and Yale University Law School. She is in the alternate universe of Berkeley, California. It's so nice to be here. And it's nice to see you guys. This week on the Gab Fest, the murder of Tyree Nichols in Memphis is another ghastly reminder of America's fundamental policing crisis. How can we make it better? Can we make it better? Then Alec McGillis will join us to discuss his fascinating article in The New Yorker about violence interrupter programs and the efforts to use early interventions to reduce urban violence. And then Joe Biden prepares to visit Kevin McCarthy's house for the State of the Union next week. What should we expect to hear? Will that speech matter? How will it matter? Plus, of course, we'll have cocktail chatter. So you want to marry my daughter? Yes, I do. So do you hang out in the hood all the time, or do you just come up here for our food and women? This January. Your family, my family. I don't know how this is going to work. I like your braids. Thank you. Exhibit had braids. Jonah Hill, Lauren London, David Duchovny, Nia Long, with Julia Louis-Dreyfus and Eddie Murphy. What's up with white cuz? Am I white cuz? Well, I'm not. You People, directed by Kenya Barris. Rated R. Now streaming only on Netflix. Tyree Nichols, a black man, was murdered in early January during a traffic stop by Memphis police. Five officers in a quasi-paramilitary scorpion unit escalated an encounter with a 29-year-old, tased, beat, and brutalized him mercilessly. Paramedics called to the scene ignored Nichols for crucial minutes, and all of this was caught on overhead police cameras and on body cameras. The five principal officers, all black, have been fired and charged with second-degree murder. Another officer has also been fired, as have EMTs and others. And the Scorpion unit has been disbanded. Emily, Nichols's murder is the highest profile police killing since George Floyd's death. It's been met with almost universal sorrow and anger. The Kamala Harris spoke at his funeral on Wednesday. Has policing changed at all since Floyd's death? And since the protests that followed it? I mean, that's such a great question. And I think the answer is maybe a tiny bit, but hardly anywhere close to enough and not in a way that protects people from these kinds of attacks. And I think it's important here, and there's been really good coverage of this, that the Scorpion unit was, you know, a, quote, elite unit in which officers were in plain clothes. They were in unmarked cars. They were encouraged to be more aggressive on the street. They were supposed to be getting the bad guys, including reckless driving. And the police chief, Sarah Lynn Davis, had kind of touted this as a success as crime went down in Memphis, though we have no idea if this unit really caused that. But there's just this basic clash in terms of public safety, right? I mean, these units are supposed to be stopping crime, but they also seem to promote a kind of wild culture that puts people in serious danger. And we've seen that in city after city, right? The Gun Trace Task Force in Baltimore, New York has had this with anti-crime units, Los Angeles. It just seems to sort of move around the country like a cancer. And whatever else is happening in police reforming, it it just completely overshadows those changes because it's just so scary. I mean, there's the, and Emily's more knowledgeable about this than me, but I mean, there are uh, police unions, which in many places are um, extremely powerful. The public comment boards that have been set up to be a check on the police often really aren't much of a check at all. Um, there's been, uh, some backlash to the reforms that have been even suggested or, or talked about in some police units in the wake of uh, George Floyd's murder. Um, there are no standards nationally, um, that could apply to all, um, police. This is one of the things that the, the George Floyd bill in Congress that died, um, 
attempted to do was put in some national standards. Um, but I talked to Kirk Buckhalter at uh, John Jay, who's a former policeman, about this. And, and he was touting the benefit of having some kind of standards that would... The training for this unit was not um, too high. If you'd had a, a different kind of mentoring operation um, with older police mentoring younger police, um, and that was standard across the country because there were national standards, you might have some abilities to basically enforce or ensure that the best practices that might ameliorate some of these issues or not put hothead cops in positions. Um, and some of these cops had been sanctioned before for their behavior, um, put them in positions where they might uh, go off. I think also there's one of the suggestions in the wake of the Tyree Nichols case is having some kind of compunction. And I wonder what you think about this, Emily. If you see a police using excessive force and you're an EMT or you're another police officer, it puts the onus on you to step in and do something. An obligation to act. So why are people saying that they should do that afterwards? They had a lot of pretty good rules. I think the Memphis police have that. Technically, there is an obligation. It's just... It's not a national standard. Also, what's so interesting, and I, this is the thing that we always seem to circle back to, is that the way that police can be policed, as it were, is you can establish sets of rules at the front end or rules at the back end, like by with the oversight boards and reviews of violent acts. So rules at the front end, which change their behavior, or rules at the back end, which punish them for bad behavior. And that that's a way to control them. But ultimately, if the tribe itself is so tribal and so self-protective and there's such a it, there's so little willingness for them to police themselves it becomes almost impossible for the culture to change i remember i read this story once about why airline safety is so much better than it used to be why are airlines safer and one of the key reasons is that it became uh, accepted practice for pilots to self-report errors and to report errors by their colleagues and it and it was not used primarily for punishment. It was used primarily for education and to prevent later risks from happening. It turned out to have a huge impact on airline safety, that once everyone became aware of common mistakes that people were making, they stopped making them. And it changed the culture of airlines, which was, I mean, not the same. It wasn't a military culture, but it was that same thing of where you don't rat on your colleague. But police just don't have anything like that. And I wonder why, Emily, I mean, why do you think it is that it, as a culture, it is so hard for police to police themselves, police each other? Yeah. I mean, I think when you see these videos, you think, how could any human being stand there and not do anything, much less participate in this like horrendous brutality? And so then it just seems so far from what you want people to be doing that it's hard to focus on the rules. But clearly the rules and standards that the Memphis Police Department had were not like any kind of match for this culture of impunity that this unit created. And I think that John's right to bring up the unions. It's also very hard to sue the police, um, either individually or even just sue the city that they're part of. And lifting that qualified immunity rule is one of the things in the George Floyd Act in Congress that has not passed. And then I think you have this question of where the police come from, whether they see themselves as basically hostile to a lot of the people they're policing. Obviously, the police want to imagine themselves as guardians of the public, but then they decide that some people are bad and that it's their job to catch and sometimes hurt the bad guys. And that's when you see these absolute tragedies. You know, look, none of us have done this work of policing on the street, and obviously it's both dangerous and also really boring. And I don't feel like I can say I have any understanding of it. But I do think that when you have these law enforcement agencies that have so much power, that the front end and back end accountability you were talking about, David, just becomes all the more crucial. And this is something our colleague Jamel Bowie wrote about really well this week. And it just seems to be lacking. And we don't seem to have the national will to really address it. So we have these episodic, horrible incidents and some changes in some local places like Colorado has better rules right now. Um, and maybe that's related to the Elijah McClain uh, killing John. But it doesn't seem to translate into the will to really make national change. Well, it's the same with the EMTs who waited 20 minutes before. Um, and we saw this um, in the Elijah McClain case where the EMTs 
um, are also a part of the problem. Can I say a word about Memphis? Because I uh, did a lot of reporting there several years ago, and I've been watching with a special interest because um, of that city's history. You know, the police in Memphis have a long track record of racism, and there have been other um, killings of unarmed people, especially uh, black people in the past that have gone unaddressed. It also had a very hard charging district attorney for years, Amy Wyrick, who I wrote about um, in my book. And she was defeated last year by Steve Mulroy, the current district attorney. And that is a good part of the story. These murder charges against the police were brought very quickly. And also, Davis, the police chief, did a much faster investigation than is normal. And I think that is a, it's worth talking about that one bright note, because the fact that these officers um, are being charged, that there seems to be a recognition throughout the city that this was horrible and a lack of defensiveness about what happened from the city's law enforcement leaders, it's important. It helped Memphis not blow up, along with some excellent um, organizers in Memphis who, you know, have been doing this work for years and I think are really trusted and respected in the city. But that is a bright note in this that can't be taken for granted. If Amy Wyrick had still been the prosecutor, I can't imagine we would be seeing these charges right now. And that would be a much worse situation. My answer didn't finish off the backlash point I was trying to bring home, which is that if you look at the last election, it was not as effective as Republicans thought it would be, but running on crime as an issue certainly was something that Democrats felt defensive about. Um, and when you talk about a national movement to get behind changing the qualified immunity um, laws, that's what you would need because that's what held up the George Floyd bill and will continue to hold it up. I don't think the Republicans have changed their position at all. And if it requires 60 votes in the Senate, then that's not going to get it. There was the politics of that would put pressure on an, for, at a national level were actually going against where they were in the summer of 2020. And that's not a foregone conclusion, because in the Elijah McClain case, it was almost the case that the EMT and police were going to kind of we're going to get off um, without without full scrutiny. Um, and 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 also body camera footage. Um being in existence at all, I mean, that's one of the things that national standard for body cam footage, I believe, is in the George Floyd bill. That also is a benefit. That was also at play here in in terms of improving the situation. One other thing that I think is a part of the national conversation is you see somebody like Congressman Jim Jordan, which I think we've seen on a number of other issues, does not argue in good faith. So I'm not holding him up as an example of everybody, but I do hold this up as an example of safe harbor for those who don't want to wrestle with the complexity of the issue. Jim Jordan's saying essentially, well, this is evil. And in other words, sort of throwing up his hands. I'm a lawmaker, but we can't make any laws about this. Um, and I think there are uh, there is some portion of people who will say, well, these bad apples and um, what are you going to do? The hilarious thing is that we make laws about evil all the time. Like that's what that's like a law of its murder. Right. That's kind of what the law does. I know. I know. I know. I know. I struggle with, and I, and I confess I have not watched the the tape of Nichols's killing. I chose not to watch it. Um, I'm rarely surprised when I hear about a shooting death by a cop, even when cops mistake an innocent, someone holding an innocent object, they're holding a gun, they shoot somebody, or they shoot somebody who's not even holding it, just because, they, because when you have a gun, the possibility of a fatal error is enormously high. The possibility of a small mistake becoming a gigantic mistake is huge. The the deaths that occur like this or like George Floyd's death or others that we've said, Rodney King, that o occur over some time with violence conveyed by multiple people in this against somebody who is small, innocent, unarmed, is astonishing to me. I don't understand what it is in the human condition that doesn't cause people to restrain themselves. I mean, they, there must be so much anger and frustration and and fear built up in these officers somehow that they feel like they need to unleash it upon a person who is defenseless. It's it's shocking to me when when this happens and the psychology of it is confusing. 
I did watch the video and I don't think that it would really explain it to you because you just see this total dehumanization and it's really hard to understand how that unfolded because it does unfold over time. So I'm not going to try to explain it. Emily, just bring us home with this. Can you think of examples? To, so this is not such a gloomy conversation. Can you think of examples of police reforms, even at a small level, that have stuck, are stuck, and that could be models for improvements for the country? Um, I mean, I think often we point to the Camden, New Jersey police force in this conversation. They had this kind of accident where there was this moment because of state law, they got to just totally remake the whole department. Scott Thompson, the Camden police chief at the time, came in and just was able to, I mean, people left and retired uh, that he would have wanted to get rid of. And then they were gone and he got to kind of start over. And Camden, which had had really poor rates of excessive force and other problems with the police, really improved. I haven't checked into them lately, so I don't want to vouch for them right at this moment. But that is one example people give. And I think the question is whether in a larger city and without the sort of weird coincidences of that story, whether you can have the same kind of um, real boost that that everybody sees. I mean, a lot of cities, it's worse. Um, So yeah, I don't know if maybe something about the size of the city and the kind of claims the police make and that other politicians make about crime and how dangerous it is. I don't know if that, although Camden is, was a dangerous place too. Actually, can I just make two very other quick points? One, I feel like disbanding a lot of these paramilitary units might be a good place to start. It doesn't feel like that would make cities safer, even if police like to be in them the other thing that was so uh which we didn't talk about is the um the dishonest police report that was filed like one of the problems is that 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 you can't as a public citizen you want to be able to trust that the police are accounting for things honestly but then in this case as in so many cases what they say is completely contradicted by the evidence of the cameras which shows that their behavior is absolutely utterly different and then what instigated this was utterly different from what they claim that mistrust and that willful creation of mistrust is incredibly bad well they were covering up but yeah when you read the very banal prose that's a description of a terrible killing it's absolutely chilling slate plus members you get bonus segments on the gab fest and other slate podcasts you get member exclusive episodes from shows like Slow Burn and Amicus. Of course, there are no ads on any podcast for Slate Plus members. If you go to slate.com slash GabFest Plus, you can become a member today. And you would get to hear our conversation about The Banshees of Inishirin, a movie that John and Emily were so obsessed with that they hectored and harried and and bullied me into watching it so that we could discuss it. So we're going to discuss The Banshees of Inishirin today on Slate Plus. Go to slate.com slash GabFest Plus to become a member. This episode of the GabFest is sponsored by Masterclass. With Masterclass, you can learn from the world's best artists, icons, and leaders anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace. You could learn songwriting from John Legend, or Mariah Carey could teach you how to use your voice as an instrument. You could learn the power of personal branding from Chris Jenner. You could learn business strategy from Bob Iger, who is running Disney. With over 2,500 classes from a range of world-class instructors, the thing you've always wanted to do is closer than you think. I took a class called Meet Your Hero's Hero, and the first class in that series is Neil Gaiman, J.R.R. Tolkien, who is his hero. And he describes Tolkien as the most important author of the 20th century, and he talks about how Tolkien built worlds, how he collaborated with readers. I learned that Neil Gaiman is English, which I hadn't even realized. The second class in that series is going to be Gloria Steinem on Bella Abzug. Amazing. So get unlimited access to every class. And as a GabFest listener, you get 15% off an annual membership. Go to masterclass.com slash GabFest now. That's masterclass.com slash GabFest for 15% off Masterclass. This episode of the GabFest is sponsored by MindBloom. There's no quick fix for anxiety and depression. But sometimes you need something to unlock your brain, a new way of thinking about and seeing the world. And maybe that thing is guided ketamine therapy from MindBloom. MindBloom is the leader in at-home ketamine therapy for people looking for a new way to treat their anxiety and depression. They combine science-backed medicine with a guided treatment plan that's both affordable and fast-acting. 
To begin, take MindBloom's online assessment and schedule a video consult with a licensed psychiatric clinician. If approved, you'll work with MindBloom on your specific treatment plan, and you'll be mailed a customized kit complete with medicine, a journal, and treatment materials. After only two sessions, 87% of MindBloom clients reported improvements in depression, and 85% reported improvements in anxiety. It's time to enter your next chapter in mental health and well-being. Achieve transformational outcomes with MindBloom. Right now, MindBloom is offering our listeners $100 off your first six-session program when you sign up at mindbloom.com slash gabfest and use promo code gabfest at checkout. Go to mindbloom.com slash gabfest, promo code gabfest for $100 off your first six-session program today. That's mindbloom.com slash gabfest, promo code gabfest. We're joined by Alec McGillis, the brilliant Baltimore-based journalist. Alec's latest piece in The New Yorker is very much in the spirit of our last topic. It's an article titled, When Law Enforcement Alone Can't Stop the Violence. And it's about efforts to find non-policing ways to prevent urban violence. These efforts, the most well-known of which I would, I guess, because I'd heard of it before, is the violence interrupters are receiving hundreds of millions of dollars in new federal funding under the American Rescue Plan Act. Alec, I want to start with a mega broad question. You write about two schools of non-law enforcement violence prevention, the violence interrupter model and the ROCA model, if I'm pronouncing that right. What are those two schools? What is the premise behind each of them and where are they being tried? Um, the one school, the interrupter model school, is generally known nationally as cure violence. And that goes back to the late 90s when an epidemiologist by the name of Gary Slutkin, who had done been working on public health crises around the world, including HIV and cholera, came back to Chicago and decided that he was going to take on gun violence as his next kind of public health cause. And he came up with this idea of using interrupters, um, basically, in quote, credible, credible messengers, men who've um, who've committed violence themselves, done time in prison themselves, um, who now want to help to fight the violence that they themselves were part of. And they get hired to go out in the street and to intervene in conflicts, to try to defuse things before they get violent. That started back around 2000 in Chicago and has spread to all these other cities, um, including in, in Baltimore, where it goes by a program called Safe Streets. Um, but then in more recent years, there's been this new model that's come along um, pioneered by, initially by a group out of Massachusetts called ROCA. Um, and, and that takes a much different approach. It's a more kind of long-term approach where instead of, instead of trying to intervene in the moment, um, you're working with young men who are deemed likely to be perpetrators or victims of violence. And you're basically trying to work with them um, to, so that they are less likely to end up in moments of conflicts to begin with. The, um, you're, you're giving them paid employment, typically. There's, there's sort of jobs programs to help them get basic job skills and, and, and job habits. But more importantly, you're giving them rudimentary training in behavioral, uh, cognitive behavioral theory so that you're helping them regulate their emotions, helping them um, sort of avoid using their, quote, bottom brain in moments of stress and conflict so that they're less likely to kind of flare up in those moments. And, and that has now also started spreading around the country. And in Chicago, it was taken up by a big new initiative in Chicago called Ready Chicago. Um, and, and those are the two sort of main different schools of thought out there that are now competing for this huge new pot of federal funding that's come out of Washington. So basically, we're talking about on the spot prevention in the moment, and then this more long term investment in trying to figure out which people are likely to commit violence or be victims in violence and invest in them in a way that could have some prevention effect. One of the questions in your piece is whether these groups are competing for funding in a way where they're becoming kind of rivals and critics of each other. As I was reading, I thought, well, in some ideal world, and I know that's not any city that we all actually live in, but wouldn't you want to have both of these um, tactics and wouldn't you want them to be working together with these different approaches, um, at least as we're trying to figure out which of them has a real effect? Absolutely. In that ideal world, you you would love to have both of them. And there are some places that are trying to do both at the same time and trying to sort of yoke them together. 
The problem is that in a lot of cities, you have the, the sort of effort to oversee everything, to kind of pull things together and have these different efforts working together is being led by these sort of little known public safety agencies within city halls um, that have kind of sprung up over the last few years that are have been very kind of fledgling in a lot of cities. Just a few people often are in these public safety offices. They're often called the mayor's office of criminal justice or the office of safe neighborhoods. They have those kind of names. And they've just been like a few people in a lot of cities. And suddenly they've got these millions of dollars to spend and they've got to sort of pull everyone together and get everyone working together. And in some cities, they're more up to this task than others. And that's the real problem now. One of the real problems is you've got this, these really kind of overmatched um, bureaucracies in a lot of cities that are tasked with trying to make this all work. And, and unfortunately, the money is going to run out in just a couple of years, um, this kind of deluge of federal money. And then the question is going to be, who gets the money? Who gets what's left at that point? Who is deemed to be successful enough that they're able to proceed? It really reminded me of once I spent a lot of time with a startup um, out in Silicon Valley, and they were talking about the danger of receiving too much money too fast. Is it just you're trying to figure out what you're doing, and that's one set of challenges, and then a flood of money creates a whole other set of challenges that removes your ability to focus on the the smaller task at hand. Related to that, Alec, are Roca and Ready Chicago more scalable because they? it just seemed like Safe Streets was more kind of really dependent on the individuals, the read of the community, the changing nature of the community, if it's moving over into something on Instagram, it really required the talents of individuals, whereas the longer term programs kind of tried to deal with kind of human nature more broadly and felt therefore like it was more scalable to other cities. Does that seem right? That's a really good insight. I mean, the cure violence model, the safe streets interrupter model has been used all around the country. So in that sense, it's it certainly is scalable. There's and a lot of cities are now starting up new interrupter programs with their federal money. But it does depend much more on sort of the, the motivation and talents and commitment of the individual interrupter. And, and the piece I focus on this one guy in Baltimore who's been doing it for many years and is very committed to the task. It is much more kind of individually based in that sense. There's also much more of a honestly, a personal risk to that work. Um, they're much more on the front lines. You're going out, deliberately going out when things are hot and trying to cool things down. And, and Baltimore has incredibly lost three of these interrupters in the span of just 13 months recently. Um, and, and there's beyond that kind of risk, there's just the much more general kind of emotional wear and tear that these men take um, being out there. These are men who, of course, been through a lot already in their lives, and now they're out there seeing a whole lot. Whereas the, the ROCA approach is much more professionalized in a sense. You get the sense that those organizations are are more professionally run. They're much more careful about where they send their workers. Um, uh, when, when things are really hot in a given neighborhood, they might not send someone out there. Um, they have they maintain channels with the police, unlike unlike the interrupters. Um, and so they they're in, they sort of have that channel open to, to be getting uh, intelligence from the cops about about what's what's going on out there. And they argue is they're more suited to this moment now where so much violence is is not being driven anymore by gangs where you can sort of be doing the interrupter thing and negotiating between the gangs. And now it's much more often about these impulsive things that are flaring up in the moment. And it's more important to help young men um, sort of respond well in those moments rather than sending someone out to, to be trying to break things up. Often... When it comes to issues involving crime, especially violent crime, it feels like the there are bigger social, mysterious, inexplicable social forces that determine changes. That we had massive decline in murders in cities across the U.S. for a generation. Now we have a rise everywhere. How did these efforts fit into trying to understand what are the actual causes of urban violence? And it, and I guess maybe the question I'm trying to ask is: Is there any evidence that either of these approaches actually has an impact. It's really hard to do assessments of these programs, especially of the interrupter programs, because the interrupter programs are essentially targeting a given area, like a given neighborhood. That they they, are, they usually are very focused in, especially high violence parts of town. And it's really hard to know over the course of time whether a drop in shootings in a given place is due to the work of the interrupters or all the other factors that are kind of impinging on a given place. With a ROCA ready model where you're focusing on a certain a group of young men, it's easier to track that in a sense because you can just sort of track the outcomes of those guys and sort of 
Did they are they still in work? Are they have they stayed out of prison? Have they gotten shot? Have they shot someone else? That's somewhat easier to assess. But as far as how they're they're now sort of fitting in with this terrible trend that we're in the middle of, a case could be made that in some ways they are both kind of suited to to this moment we're in because as I've reported before, at least last couple of years, a lot of what seems to be happening um, with this terrible surge that we're in the middle of since the start of the pandemic has been an essentially a breakdown in the social fabric. And a lot of people just feeling like they've been left completely on their own as various institutions, whether it's schools or libraries or the various outreach programs that, that were in place for people like this have often closed up, closed their doors and went remote and left a lot of people to fend for themselves. And so the, to the extent that these programs are each in their own way trying to, um, to do outreach and pull people back in and restore the, the local fabric in some capacity, they do seem to be, in that sense, suited to the moment. I finished your piece feeling like I had a new appreciation of how difficult and dangerous this work can be. I mean, when you said that Baltimore lost three violence interrupters, you meant that they got killed. I also felt like I wanted it to continue. I mean, partly it's out of frustration with the police and law enforcement and this fear that the police can become a kind of occupying force in um, places where crime is concentrated. But also, I just wanted these community members to be kind of out there doing this sort of outreach. And at one point in the piece, you're wrestling with this question of, what you were just talking about. Can we study this? Do we know whether it's effective? And you have this great quote from someone who's saying, look, when violence goes up or down in a city, we don't cancel the police, right? They get to keep going. No one holds them to that standard. And I know this is a new effort. And uh, there's this big question of whether it can handle the money that is now available to it from the federal government. But I just feel like it's really important to let this um, kind of experiment play out another few steps. I mean, Cure Violence has some more history behind it. And I obviously like innovating and making sure that your approach is a good fit for what's actually happening on the streets you're trying to make safe is really important. Um, but I wondered what your conclusion about all of this was. That's a, a piece in which there's a ton of great reporting and I learned so much, but I felt like you weren't quite coming down, which is fine. But then maybe want to ask you. I agree, basically, that these programs should be given uh, more of a chance, more of a runway. The person you quoted is a public health researcher out at UC Davis um, and by the name of Shani Bugs. And her point is basically that this these programs should just simply become a permanent part of city infrastructure, right, alongside public works and the health department and the schools and all the rest, that you should have community violence intervention as a permanent feature of city government. And it should not be having to be judged on the upticks or downticks of the violence rate in a given year to sort of prove its mettle, that it should just be part of what we do at, on an ongoing basis. I think the biggest concern about this work really is, um, and the one that I, I think put most, most stock in is a guy by the name of Eddie Bocanegra, who has, has a remarkable story of having committed a murder as a young man, done 15 years in prison, and then Part of the federal money for these programs is now being overseen by by him in Washington and the Department of Justice. It's quite a remarkable story. And and his basic concern is that the workforce just isn't there right now to do this work, that we need a lot more of this work, but we haven't been building up the workforce to do the frontline intervention work and that the workers that we do have are, are deeply traumatized and are not being maybe trained enough, not being supported enough, not getting certainly not being paid enough. Uh, not being helped to advance to to other kinds of work as they get older. And if we're going to be expecting so much of this non-police approach to public safety, that we simply have to be much more serious about building up the actual labor to be doing it. Yeah, it feels like the challenges are both the resources overmatch the capacity and while the breakdown in social norms makes the situation all the more acute and more in need of it, it also would seem to me like it adds a lot of noise to the system. It's hard to study something when you've got like hard to control for the complete breakdown of social fabric. And so I'll add on to that just the question, which is does making a federal case of it, so to speak, um, are there benefits to that? In other words, that the Justice Department that can bring that are idiosyncrasies of this moment that are on the upside, not just the challenges we've identified. Oh, definitely. And the fact that they've actually 
put someone in place. There was no one in Washington at the DOJ doing the job that this guy, Eddie Bocanegra, is now doing. They, Biden basically created a whole new position to to oversee this whole effort and help all these different groups and, and cities and, and spending the money and trying to do it right. There is a fundamental tension there between as what you're basically trying to do now is kind of systematize and bureaucratize this whole approach that's been very fly-by-night and organic over the years. And a lot of the workers, the frontline workers, bristle at that. They don't like having having to become sort of a more official thing with all sorts of reporting duties and training duties and being made part of the bureaucracy. They see their work as being very um, organic on the front lines, uh, all about feel. And there's that basic tension, too. Alec McGillis's article in The New Yorker is, When Law Enforcement Alone Can't Stop the Violence. Alec, thank you for coming back on the GabFest. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. One of the most important events of the 19th century was the gold rush. Thousands moved west for a better life. And for those who survived the journey, they soon learned that California was no paradise. American History Tellers is a podcast that explores the events and people who shaped our history. And their newest season, California Gold Rush, tells the tale of those who risked life and limb to strike it rich. Hundreds of thousands developed gold fever and uprooted their lives flooding into California. If they survived the journey, there were swindlers, crooks, and charlatans to take advantage of hapless settlers. The gold rush accelerated the nation's expansion and cemented California's worldwide reputation as a destination for big dreamers. American History Tellers makes history accessible and engaging and provides lessons that are applicable today. So if you're a history buff, then this is the podcast for you. Follow American History Tellers wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. On Tuesday, President Biden will deliver a State of the Union to the joint session of Congress. And on Wednesday morning, you will have forgotten everything he said, as well as everything that was said about it. And yet, it is an important moment. The ceremony is quite pleasant. And it's important because it's the moment when the Biden presidency encounters uh, Kevin McCarthy's house and their conflicts begin in earnest. And it's also the moment when Biden's presidential campaign begins, in a, in a sense. So, John, what is going to be important about the State of the Union? Have I, have I characterized it correctly? What, what will Biden use it for? I think you've characterized it excellently, which is a really important thing to know about State of the Unions, which is that they are a marker in time. They are themselves forgettable. But I think in this moment, you've nailed two th- important things. One is is that he's he's interacting with Kevin McCarthy's house, And then also it's the beginning of what looks like a presidential campaign. Ron Klain, the outgoing chief of staff, referred to um, Joe Biden's 2024 campaign as a for as a fact in his departure speech. I think what's interesting to me about McCarthy is the president on Wednesday of this week had his first meeting with McCarthy to discuss the debt ceiling and whether there are any negotiations or not in the debt ceiling. And I think politically... The question is whether Biden will use the State of the Union or the next year to continue to draw distinctions with the Trump wing of the Republican Party, or whether he does what Obama did or tried to do for the first uh, part of his first term, which was try to behave reasonably in public and then let the Republicans um, be defined by their most extreme members and just um, benefit from the comparison. So the way that would play out is Biden's been doing all of these infrastructure um, uh, events in the walk up to the State of the Union and basically say, I worked on bipartisan legislation that's delivering to people in their communities. You're starting to see it. The economy is doing better. Um, inflation is going down. His approval ratings are at 44 percent, which I think is as high as they've been. And just be Joe, the guy who was elected, and let the Republicans define themselves, or do what he did earlier this week, which was be specific about what the quote unquote MAGA Republicans are going to do with their budget cuts and that they are going to imperil um, the kinds of programs people care about. So basically, one is is going on offense, and the other is sort of going on offense um, by not going on offense, if that makes sense. Um, and so that'll be interesting to see because it'll be a signal about how we expect the next year to play out. Um, as he positions himself for his presidential run. So, Emily, the kind of shadow hanging over Washington and the way hanging over, hanging over the country is this debt ceiling question, is the fact that, that the country is, uh, has run out of debt authorization and already the Department of the Treasury is doing chicanery to 
keep paying bills, that chicanery can only last so long. And it means that at some point the Congress has to extend the debt ceiling or the Biden administration has to sort of say the debt ceiling isn't real. When do you think the negotiations for the debt ceiling are going to happen in earnest? Are we going to have four months of shadow boxing and really nothing's going to happen? Oh, my God, that is the most depressing thing, because this is the most boring and unnecessary conversation. I mean, I guess they're not going to get serious until it's clear what the Republicans actually want. Right. I mean, right now. Right, John, we don't even have a sense of what budget cuts they're actually asking for. They don't they don't know what they want. They don't know what they, they, want, know what and they, they want. No, they don't know what they want. And they also don't want to say what they want, because the minute they say what they want, it allows the party to be defined by their most extreme member. Uh, and the reason these things don't get dealt with for, you know, years and years and years and years and years is because nobody has the courage to say what they want. And the people who used to have the courage to say what they want, um, Paul Ryan and John Kasich, you know, got pounded for it. No, not Kasich so much, really, Paul Ryan. And, and and the Republican position in the MAGA wing is totally untenable, which is massive budget cuts, but don't touch anything that would actually be a massive budget cut. Right. So and also don't raise tax. Don't raise taxes. Yeah. So it's intellectually hollow. And so if you've got nothing to say, best not to say it. So does that just keep going for all these low these four months? Or do they pay a political price for it and then they have to stop earlier? I mean... How are they going to they're not up for election right now. So it seems like it could just dribble on and on. This is what this is really an interesting question. So it, it, I think it becomes too painful. And I mean, the, the, the ultimate get out of this issue situation would be a discharge petition in which a majority of House members surpa- go around McCarthy. And that would require all of the Democrats and some number of moderate Republicans to join together and lift the def- debt ceiling. That's the thing at the end. If the markets start to freak that could happen to solve this. So it's not entirely in Kevin McCarthy's hands. Now, that would make some number of moderate Republicans pariahs, and that there's a cost to that these days in politics, even if you live in a blue, bluish district or a moderate district, because of the sort of violent wing of the party that um, that exists and people who fundraise off of that violence and who encourage self-actualization and violence So, you know, not not so easy to just say, oh, I'll join with the Democrats. I want to talk for a second about this strange presidential race. I I, because I have the memory of a gnat, I can't remember like when presidential campaigns start. But it is kind of weird that we have the two leading candidates for president in Trump and Biden appearing to have no particular appetite for a race right now. I mean, Biden, I guess, wants to be continue to be president. Mostly, I think he wants to continue to prevent Republicans from being president and sees himself as the kind of best hope for that. And Trump, who's attempting to start a campaign, but it's sad. It's like he's like it's like Spinal Tap in the later years. He's doing free jazz performances or something to cloud crowds of twelve at a puppet show. <laughs> the Passaic Community Theater presents. But when is this thing going to start? John, is it going to pick up? Well, you know, what's so funny about the Republican side is that it is late starting and yet the vitriol is early starting. So the normal pattern has most in the main been candidates start running just after they um, take their first steps as a toddler and they run forever and ever and ever. And then at some point after about 97 debates, um, somebody says something that might seem pointed Um What's happened now is the announcements are late, but they've been shooting in the Republican side at each other with real vitriol. So Mike Pompeo, who's likely to run, writes a book about how um, how tough he is. And in that book attacks uh, Nikki Haley for being an opportunist and essentially trying to angle her way with Jared and Ivanka to become the vice president. Haley then shoots back at Pompeo. Pompeo says Trump doesn't understand the nature of public service. Trump shoots it uh, or says some disparaging thing about Pompeo. Trump, I think, has said some mildly disparaging things about Pence. And he's compared this week. He re- he put he posted on uh, his social media platform an, a video of Ron DeSantis saying that he wanted to be a leader in the mold of Paul Ryan, which is something you're not allowed to to say uh, in the Republican Party at the moment. Um, and so all of this back and forth and cut and thrust has happened before the campaign has started, which gives you um, some sense of how it's likely to escalate. Um, and so that's another part of this uh, contest that is 
Um, interesting. Nikki Haley is going to announce on the 15th of February uh, in Charleston. So is Haley going to is Haley going to run as like the sane person? Is that her lane? Well, I suppose she is. But then the problem is that um, I mean, there are many problems to a Haley candidacy. Um, but if she's going to run as the sane person, she has to then develop some position about Donald Trump, who she's praised um I mean, she attacked him at first, of course, when she was supporting others in the primary uh, in 2016. But then she became a Trump um, supporter in a number of different ways, both specifically about Trump and then all his policies. And so now sanity, I think, is the only way to define yourself truly as the kind of sane wing of the Republican Party is in opposition to or opposition to Donald Trump. And I don't know if she has the stomach for that because it, of course, it means you're going to get a whole lot of grief if you do that. What just in closing, just on Tuesday night, what is your prediction for the act of of clownish delinquency that will be displayed by some Republican member of the House? Will Matt Gates trip Joe Biden as he walks down the aisle? Will Will Kevin McCarthy make paper airplanes out of the speech and toss them at Justice Sotomayor? What is the particular? act of of delinquency that we're going to see? Well, I don't know. And I refuse to um, nourish Speculate myself about such a thing. Uh, no, I, I, I've, I've, I refuse to nourish myself on the lemon that you're offering me. Um, instead, I'm going to make the opposite case. The state, state of the union is it's one more tending of the bonsai tree of democracy in the post Trump era. And though it's a silly thing, I think Biden going and doing that thing and having it not erupt into foolishness, I'm sure he will be extra gracious to the new speaker as a way of doing what I was talking about earlier. But also every time, you know, uh, that that one of these parts of the bonsai is tended, it's a good thing for those who believe in ceremony and institutions. I mean, remember, this is just the kind of ceremony that Donald Trump sought to destroy as a way of um, overturning the election. David loves this. You're warming his heart. Well, as you'll see in my cocktail ch- chatter, it's it's on my mind. Let's go to that cocktail chatter. Let's go to a cocktail chatter where we're going to get to learn what's on John Dickerson's mind. John, at post State of the Union, kicking back, having a cold one. What are you going to be chattering about? My cocktail chatter is about a book called The Fight of His Life, Inside Joe Biden's White House by Chris Whipple. He is the author, and I've talked about him before and certainly cited him a million times in his book, The Gatekeepers, which is about White House chiefs of staff. It's about Joe Biden's administration so far. And what struck me in reading it is, and my um, excessive uh, peroration about um, the State of the Union is informed by this, is when you read this, when you read the book, it has the rhythms of all of these books about presidencies, which is, you know, the the transition from one to the other and the kind of you're introduced to the players and the behind the scenes meetings. And these, you know, they have a certain pattern because all presidencies have a certain pattern, except what is different about this is the new president is coming in amidst an attempt by the previous one to kick out the central tenet of democracy. So it's the, it's this weird act of dissonance. You're reading about like preparations for the presidency, but then you have the previous guy who basically tried to destroy the office. And it's why it's very much on my mind and also a reminder that we should not let that stray too far from our field of vision. I mean, the, the odds on favor to the Republican Party is somebody who tried to overthrow an election. And so that's important. But anyway, this is also a very good behind the scenes look at how, you, how a White House is built, what that transition period was like, how Biden wrestled, and how this team of, of people who had the kind of experience, if you were, if you were making the case for an experience-minded presidency, you would, you would pick the Biden White House. Um, you know, how they struggled, where they fell short, where they succeeded, at least in Whipple's view. And it's a useful read if you're thinking about Joe Biden and whether he deserves another, another four years. And also back to that issue about restoring the norms of the presidency, one of which is that you should hire people who have some uh, familiarity with the job that they're doing, whether it's the president or anybody who works for him or her. Emily, what is your chatter? I am going to do a double chatter. Um, I want to recommend a new podcast, a kind of thriller narrative podcast. It's called Never Seen Again. It's by my friend Jake Halpern, and it's part of a series he's been doing called Deep Cover. 
And this is, I think, my favorite season of this podcast so far. It's about two young women who go missing on opposite sides of the country in 1999. Their cases wind up being connected mostly by this one detective who gets obsessed with trying to solve these disappearances. And then it turns into this big national Do detectives hunt. ever not get obsessed? Are detectives ever like, I'm really not obsessed with this case. I'm just... I think if the can't focus on this thing. Then there's no podcast, right? Like right, exactly. Someone... Very short podcast. Yeah, there was exactly. this murder. Couldn't figure it out. I don't know. Went uh, to they lunch. gave up. That's oh, well. the podcast. Had a beef exactly. burger at lunch. <laughs> this detective is a good character. And mostly one of the women who winds up really telling her story in this show is a really compelling character who's been through a lot. And um, anyway, I really recommend it. Never seen again part of the Deep Cover series. And I'm also going to try everyone's patience by recommending a book. This is such an unlikely book for me to be recommending, but it was so good. It's called Dilla Time, The Life and Afterlife of Jay Dilla, the hip hop producer who reinvented rhythm. It's by Dan Charnas, who is a music professor. And it's about this hip hop producer who really does change the way rhythm works um, with a lot of the um, bands, the hip hop bands he works with. And I learned so much about rhythm and beat. It's a great story and Dilla's a great character. But I think what I loved the most is that Charnas draws these graphs and charts of a straight beat, a swing beat, coming down hard on the one. He explains ragtime. And then he tells you about particular songs you can listen to where you can hear the beat shift. A Kendrick Lamar song called Complexion, Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen turns out to be famous for this. And he tells you exactly what seconds to listen to. Listen to so you can hear the shift. I loved it. Anyway, Dilla Time by Dan Charnas. Emily, you are down with the beats. I know. It was like really a you chatter. I think you would love this book. My chatter. I'm also doing two chatters. First, totally self-interested, but genuinely big hearted, which is that CityCast, my beloved podcasting and newsletter company, now has new daily podcasts in Madison, Wisconsin and Portland, Oregon. And they are so good. Both those podcasts went daily this week. They're incredibly good. If you are interested in those cities, you live in those cities and you're a GabFest listener, I urge you to give them a shot. Madison, Bianca Martin is just this buoyant ray of light uh, in a dark dark day. And in Portland, Claudia Meza is so funny. She's so quick. She and I actually had a very funny conversation this week uh, for an episode of of CityCast Portland, but please listen to CityCast Portland and CityCast Madison if you're there. And in general, if you're in a CityCast city, we're we're firing on all cylinders. My real chatter is, you guys know, I'm an enthusiast for a lot of things. I can get excited about a lot of things. This is possibly the most enthusiastic endorsement I have ever given for anything in my entire life. I am reading a book that I am so happy to be reading. I was up at five today reading it. I was up at 1130 last night, which is way past my bedtime, I assure you, reading it. I can't wait to keep reading it. It is Demon Copperhead, the Barbara Kingsolver novel, which is a retelling of David Copperfield set in Appalachia, set in modern day Appalachia. And it's a fucking incredible book. If you read David Copperfield or saw a movie of David Copperfield, you must read this because it's the way she turns it inside out, retells it, kind of finds the analogies between 19th century England and and modern rural America. It's astonishing. Just that act of, of, of relocation is astonishing, like much better than any book I've ever done that tried to do it or any movie that tried to relocate, you know, Emma, Emma as clueless or whatever it is. Um, so that's one part. The second part is that the voice of the novel is the it's told by the David Copperfield character, da- Demon, uh, and it's an amazing voice. It's like a beautiful, funny, self aware, har- harrowing, incredibly modern voice. I cannot tell you how good this book is. If you have any interest in in the subject, you must get it and read it. It's so good. It's on our dining room table because somebody, uh, a friend of ours, said, I gave it this same same recommendation. I love to read, but this that feeling of being up, 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 and not wanting to go to bed is—I haven't had that in a while. And man, do I have it with this book! I'm uh, 
based on you and Emily and my son, uh, and I guess Anne too, um, reading um, P- uh, Philip Pullman, because uh, I've read the Book of Dust, but I hadn't read the original series, to which that is a prequel. So now I'm uh, I'm right along there with Lyra, behaving like I'm 18. So um, I have that ahead of me. Listeners, you have sent us lots of good chatters. You keep emailing them to us at gabfest at slate.com and tweeting them to us at, at slate gabfest. And our listener chatter this week comes from David Foreman. Hi, Gabfesters. This is David Foreman from West Philadelphia, and I am pleased to share an article I read on artnet.com about architect David Romero. Romero has created vividly realistic renderings of never built and demolished Frank Lloyd Wright buildings. Some of the images reveal unrealized details like the interior light of Trinity Chapel intended to be built in Oklahoma. Some exhibit a whimsical weirdness, like the floating cabins on Lake Tahoe. I think my favorite is the Illinois, the impossibly tall skyscraper in Chicago, measuring a mile high and dwarfing the city skyline like a giant golden Flash Gordon rocket parked on Lake Michigan. Romero also recreates some demolished buildings, allowing us to see long-lost structures like the Larkin Administration Building in Buffalo, imposing and ponderous on the outside, but surprisingly warm and spacious inside. I was really happy to see these images because Wright's Falling Water is one of my favorite places to visit when I go see family and friends in the Pittsburgh area. I hope Romero's efforts actually inspire someone to build one of them so I can visit it as well, especially the floating cabins on Lake Tahoe. Thanks so much. That's our show for today. The Gap Fest is produced by Shana Roth. Our researcher is Bridget Dunlap. Our theme music is by They Might Be Giants. Ben Richmond is Senior Director for Podcast Operations. And Alicia Montgomery is VP of Audio, comma, Slate. Please follow us on Twitter at, at @SlateGabFest and tweet chatter to us there. For Emily Bazelon and John Dickerson, I'm David Plotz. Thanks for listening. Hi, Slate Plus. By the way, in the segment that follows, we are totally going to spoil the Banshees of Inishirin. Uh, so if you don't want to know what happens or you don't want to hear key plot points, uh, don't listen and go watch the movie, which is a truly interesting and compelling movie. So John and Emily had talked on the show and in, also in IRL in real life about the Banshees of Inishirin, um, the recent movie – I think a multiply Oscar nominated movie. And they were just like, we have to talk about it. We have to talk about it. And I said, I hadn't watched it. And they said, you have to watch it. So I watched it on Tuesday. So now we're going to talk about it. So discuss. I mean, is this movie a comedy? Well, can may I jump in front of that question or answer it by jumping in front of it? Did you, Emily, before you watched it and or you, David, had you been told it was a comedy? Yes. And the trailer makes it seem like a comedy. David? Well, I hadn't really thought about it until you guys started talking about it. And it was clear that John did not think it was a comedy. So I was like, oh, it's it's not a comedy. I think I could have, I may have diminished your enjoyment of it because I think, and Emily, tell me if you think this is insane. I think I enjoyed it more because I was expecting it to be a comedy. And so I was not braced for the wrestling and the complexity and all the things that make it a great movie. I sort of brace myself for that stuff when I'm when I'm when I'm going to watch such a movie. And since I wasn't, I experienced it differently because I'd been given the head fake of this is a comedy, like a comedy in the kind of knee slapping, which isn't to say that there aren't moments of lots of irony and and, you know, wry witticisms. But um, it ain't a comedy in the, you know, like Groundhog Day. Well, so why do you guys want to talk about it? Like, I mean, I, it's obviously a super deep movie. But oh my god! Because the 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 acting is amazing. Oh my god! The acting in each individual performance and the thing created as a whole is just gorgeous. And ah, uh. I wanted to talk about it because I think it has something quite profound to say about loneliness and male friendship and the experience of someone being close and intimate and then discarding you and and what that is like and how difficult it is to deal with. It doesn't have to be a romantic relationship for that to just have a devastating effect on someone's life. And I thought that because the acting was so strong, that was conveyed in this really deep way that I thought was amazing. There were several things that I found astonishing in the movie. First of all, it's a movie in which not a single person, there are probably... 10 vivid characters in it, eight vivid characters. Uh, 
Not a single one of them has a spouse. Not one of them has a significant primary attachment. Um, they have, well, they have attachments, but they are that none of them, none of them is married. There's only even even when we learn about the visiting musician's father, the, the, when he tells that lie about the, the visiting musician's father is not married. He is a widow. That was just a snippet from our Slate Plus conversation. If you want to hear the whole conversation, go to slate.com slash Plus to become a member today.